CBSE Board, Class 11, History, Chapter 4, Part 17. Audio by Rini Matthew. We saw about the paths to modernization which took place in both China and Japan. There was a lot of difference between the approach to colonialism and imperialism in both China and Japan. Japan was total, totally in isolation. It was a small island country which was very beneficial to the country to stay in isolation. It was not affected by any other external factors. But that was not the case with China. The imperial government in China lost political control. It was unable to reform effectively. It was convulsed by civil war. It was affected by the civil war, internal disruptions, internal problems were there because the government was not able to stand imperialism. Japan on the other hand was very successful. It was very successful in building a modern nation, na nation state. That's why I call it the path to modernization. It created a successful industrial economy. It even established a colonial empire which incorporated Taiwan and Korea. So these three developments took place in China. Building a modern nation state, creating an industrial economy which is very important when you start with a new progress, a project and also establishing whatever was put up. Establishing something is very important. It takes time but Japan was able to do it. Establishing the colonial empire which incorporated both Taiwan and Korea. Of course, it defeated China. The land was actually a great source for Japan in culture and ideals, but it defeated China because they had no other options in 1894. It defeated Russia, which was a European power. So that was the strength of Japan to defeat all these places, though it was a very small island country which was completely locked in isolation. The Chinese started reacting in a different way. They reacted very slowly. They were very shrewd in that way. They were very strategic. They took steps very carefully. They faced a lot of difficulty because they wanted to redefine their tradition which could cope with the modern world. They understood that the tradition that they were following was not going to help them to cope or even live to sustain in the modern world. So now they wanted to make a change. They wanted the whole economy and everything to undergo a change so that it will help them to cope with the modern world. They wanted to rebuild their national strength and also to become free from both Western and Japanese control because Japan was towards the path of modernization so they did not want to be under the control of both the Western and the Japanese hands. So they understood slowly that they will be able to achieve both these objectives. What are the objectives? One is to redefine their culture and tradition. Second is to stand against the power of both Western and Japanese hands to rebuild their national strength. So they understood that they will be able to achieve these objectives if they removed inequalities when they rebuilt their country through revolution. First, they had to remove inequality. So we can understand that inequality is something which stops the progress of a nation. You have to treat everybody equally, like how we believe that God doesn't look at the color, creed or race when you pray to him. So inequality is something which puts hindrances, which puts a lot of obstacles, impediments in the progress of a nation. The Chinese Communist Party was very victorious, especially after the civil war in 1949. So by the end of the 1970s, Chinese leaders also felt that an ideological system, the system was actually retarding or putting a stop in the economic growth and development. They also started feeling the urgent need to revise their economy, to revise their development, to revise their ideology and culture because that is something which is stopping their growth. This eventually led to a lot of reforms in the economy which of course brought back capitalism and the free market. 
capitalism and free market which was regulated by the new communist party i told you about the chinese communist party which of course monitored and retained political control of course japan was an advanced industrial nation by now but the drive for them to be an empire led to war and they were defeated badly at the hands of the anglo american forces they did not have the drive like china china started rebuilding her economy very slowly it was a very slow and steady progress the us occupation marked the beginning of a democratic political system the us occupation and japan started rebuilding its economy to emerge by the 1970s as a major economic power the rebuilding progress when you realize your mistakes at a very early stage it is it is very easy for you to reconcile and bring about some amendment as a person also so that is what japan and china did so it marked the beginning of a very democratic political system so this was the path of japan to modernization and it was built on capitalist principles and it took place within a world which was dominated by western colonize colonialism you should understand that all the other parts of the world was dominated and controlled by the western colonialism and imperialism but japan started moving progressing to parts of modernization with all its capitalist principles during this time which is a great achievement in the history of japan in the history of the world the expansion of japan was justified by a call it was a call for the whole world to resist completely the western domination who are you to dominate us and to liberate asia why should you be under the control of a nation of the whites what is the necessity we all have equal rights so that is something which created thought which created thought provoking uh, impetus in all the nations within all the countries so this particular development was a great lesson to other parts in the world which underlined the strength of tradition in japanese institutions and society when you give importance to your own tradition when you give importance and respect to your own culture there's a lot of change that takes place their ability to learn relearn and the strength of nationalism that is something which is very important of course china and japan had a great long tradition of historical writings lot of tradition of historical writings and history was an important guide for the rulers they of course uh, wrote a lot of things historical writings and it paved as a guide for the rulers okay so they gave importance to history people always say that you shouldn't forget the path which made you what you were the old paths so that is what something which really helped the japanese and the chinese to come to the present position the past provided the standards and the strength by which they could be judged and the rulers started establishing official departments which maintained records and write dynastic histories so they helped the official people also to keep the records and also to write dynastic or moving histories not something which was like the other parts of the world sima qian is the greatest historian of early china sima qian very important point in japan there was a lot of influence felt from the chinese culture which led to history by giving them a similar importance which give a lot of importance one of the earliest acts of the meiji government was to establish in 1869 a bureau they actually started establishing a bureau which could collect write and record what was happening over time a victor's version of the meiji restoration okay meiji government did that to collect and document everything there was a lot of respect which was given for the written word and literary ability was highly valued by this time writing history giving importance to reading everything accounts for whatever you are writing whatever you are documenting so that was really respected there was a wide range of written materials which developed over time and the first person as i told you is sima qian official histories were kept in record scholarly writings was there 
popular literature also came into being religious tracts were available so all these things were not available in the olden times so official histories scholarly writings popular literature and printing and publishing were very important and you should remember that the movable type printing was brought about by the chinese okay especially in the pre modern world and it is very possible for everyone to have a copy of what you're reading and that helped to trace the distribution of a book in the 18th century china or japan both of them were successful in it and modern scholars have used all these materials documented and recorded by the chinese and the japanese to study a lot in the present world it helped them because they gave a lot of importance to history and writing and literature of course apart from that it was the early realization the scholarship in english from joseph needham's monumental work on the history of science in chinese civilization this particular work gives an insight into what into chinese civilization or another work is there by george samson on chinese on japanese history one is on chinese civilization the other one is on japanese history and culture it was very humongous it expanded the growth and thoughts of people all over the world and there is an immense body of sophisticated scholarship available to all of us today lot of things lot of resources are available because of their initiatives which has to be appreciated in recent years writings by chinese and japanese scholars have been translated into english because of the impact that they created some of them were used to even teach abroad and write in english and in the case of chinese scholars since the 1980s they started working with japan to create the scholarly texts they started writing in japanese also so all these things were translated into english that is the point made here so we have got lot of scholarly writings from across the globe that is a point that you have to understand as a history student which gives us richer and deeper picture of these countries so it is through culture and history this is the picture of the most important historian of china sima qian chinese historian sima qian so modern scholarship has built on the work of chinese intellectuals whatever scholarship that we have today is based on the work which was collected and documented by the chinese intellectuals and the hard work that they put in liang qichuo or kume kunitake they were the pioneers of modern history in japan modern history in japan was pioneered by these two people and some of the early writings by european travelers such as the italian all these things these two people are accountable for it not two people one person i'm sorry the name is given in two forms so they wrote about the modern history in japan and earlier writings by european travelers the next person of course is marco polo and another person is the jesuit priest like matteo ricci in china they all wrote in china the last person is louis froy in japan all of whom left rich accounts of these countries they wrote a lot about japan china and that helps us to establish a lot of intellectual work even now it has also benefited from the writings of christian missionaries christian people they also started writing a lot it benefited on the records kept by the christian missionaries they also started writing a lot based on whatever was available from the chinese and the japanese it benefited from the writings of christian christian missionaries in the 19th century whose work provides valuable material for our understanding of these countries so christian missionaries also gave a lot of valuable work to understand the development and the evolution of these countries scholarship in uh, these two places i have discussed these two people they have brought about and i also told you about the japanese and chinese scholars the same point now this person naito konan he is a leading japanese scholar of china he is a scholar and his writings influenced many scholars worldwide that is why these points are repeated again because there's a point which says that many scholarly writings from japan and china influenced people all around so one such scholar was naito kunan 
who influenced all the other scholars around the world. So that is one important point.